So let's continue in the light-hearted vein with a short video. <laughs> Ah, lovely day, isn't it? Huh? Too bad. Oh, you want to get it off the bail? No, no. We live here. Oh, no. Oh, you don't live? Hardly. Ah, lovely, isn't it? Huh? Too bad. Oh, you want to get off I'm talking in French. For some reason, but anyway. Can we have the, can we have the slide up, the next one? <laughs> this is a sheep. Sheep are not clever. Even when they might be nesting. It's my privilege to begin a series in Psalm 23. With the Lord is our shepherd as an umbrella idea over the whole psalm. It'll be followed in the coming weeks by God is our rest, God is our comfort, and then finally back to me, for God is our blessing. Now while I'll treat it more seriously than the picture or Mighty Python might lead you to believe. Don't set your expectations too high, especially for sheep. Sheep are proverbially silly. But God as our shepherd is supremely beautiful. Psalm 23 is a simple psalm, easily memorised. That God will shepherd me. But it also restates in a few beautiful words the believer's secure relationship lived with God. Even unto death, even into death. Green pastures, quiet waters, not of my own finding. Right paths for me to follow, to honour, to the honour of his name. Possibly paths of deep darkness. But where he remains my shepherd nonetheless. His abundant provision for my needs. His goodness and love behind me. Like sheepdogs. Nipping at my heels whenever necessary. And wherever I go. A meaningful life ever focused on God's will forever. Who wouldn't want such tender care, ceaseless vigilance and boundless benevolence? Can you leave Psalm 23 up? Would be better, please. Christians delight to know that all this flows from the Lord being my shepherd. The problem comes for the many who want to dictate the terms. People like the idea, but they aren't interested in and won't accept the necessary reciprocal relationship implied by my shepherd. My shepherd. They can't see that the I in the next bit, I shall, means lovingly receiving, gratefully receiving, humbly receiving, eternally receiving, even. It's this beautiful idea of a loving relationship between God and to be all-inclusive from your point of view, I, God and I, God giving and me accepting with faith in Jesus, God's only son. It's a simple psalm, but it also has deep implications that many don't or won't understand. 
This loving relationship is expanded in the rest of the psalm. And we see that the peace offered is not automatic escape from tribulation. A path of righteousness might be through a dark valley. Commitment, so sorry, contentment in God's provision is not lazy complacency. Physical life still has to be lived, enjoyed, struggled, grieved. God's will still needs to be looked for and striven towards. But he remains a promised, ever-present assurance and delight. Now, shepherds aren't very common in St. Mary's. But in ancient times, shepherds lived and travelled with their sheep. They found and provided food and safe water for them. They doctored them. They guarded and defended them. A good shepherd was simply everything to their sheep. God's shepherding is first mentioned in Genesis 48, 15. Jacob says, May the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day bless these boys. He's giving a blessing. In Numbers 27, Joshua is to lead Israel by leading them out and bringing them in so they will not be like sheep without a shepherd. And in Psalm 28, David calls on God to be their shepherd and carry them forever. Carry them forever. See, it's not because God ever stops shepherding that David calls on him. He never stops shepherding no matter what the circumstance. And Isaiah 40 says, it confirms what God does. It says he carries his lambs close to his heart. That's what shepherds do. David calls on God because he knows God. He prays in God's will, which is that God wants to shepherd his people. See, recent sermons from Trent showed that prayer from a desire for a growing relationship and a growing fellowship with God will drive us to greater prayer. As we seek his will, pray in it, understand it, or faithfully accept it, if we don't understand it and live it. Because there is nothing that God desires more. See, to mimic God's shepherding was the most noble key performance indicator for Israel's leaders. And their historic failure brought into darker contrast the true, continuous and unfailing shepherding of God. And that's shown by the simple fact that Israel actually survives through the millennia. Whereas Hittites and Jebusites and Amalekites and whatever are sites, they haven't. And Jesus says in John 10... I am the good shepherd who lays down my life for the sheep. And that's the climactic measure of God's shepherding, that he lays down his life for his sheep. And then after his ascension, Jesus shepherds his people at the centre of God's throne. Revelation 7, 17, where it says, He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. And that means even tears from when we didn't understand. See, these are a few examples of what God's shepherding means. It's constant and endless. 
It's being involved in every aspect of our daily lives. It's an intimate and caring relationship. It's not just set them on their path and say, call me later if things go wrong. It's acting in the best interest of the sheep in the present moment and as every future moment becomes a present moment. It's leading his sheep through life's ups and downs and even through death with eternal life-giving resources. It's like God's invisible armies surrounding Elisha in 2 Kings 6 or Jesus in Matthew 26. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. You know, I thought perhaps Paul had that in mind while he was penning Philippians 4.12, where he said, I have learned the secret of what it means to be content in any and every situation. I have learnt the secret of being content in any and every situation. It doesn't mean necessarily that he's happy or sated or without grief and hardship. Paul is content because he faces everything, every situation, through him who provides the strength. And he provides the strength because the Lord is Paul's shepherd. You see, the rest of Psalm 23 provides examples of how God fellowships with us as he shepherds us. Rest, comfort, blessing. But there for the coming weeks. But while still in this imperfect, fallen world. Still struggling, I pray, against sin, the world and the devil from the old baptism service. I know I have downplayed the all-encompassing of God's shepherding. My natural self-centeredness can boast my own involvement complain God's apparent lack of clarity or rationalise a desire or a want to be seen to be doing something for God. Perhaps where my motive, if I made the effort to realise, might not be as squeaky clean before God as I think. And having listened carefully over the last few weeks, that is undeniable. Undeniable. Now some might downplay God by believing that perhaps in some small way we actually help God save us. Or when we share the gospel with someone, perhaps we're helping God save them. I mean, we responded in faith when God called, so might that just mean that I'm working with God in my salvation? Now that, men spent years during the Middle Ages arguing about that very question. After all, doesn't the Bible say the Lord helps those that help themselves? Doesn't a lot of Christian sermonising centre around how I should be doing Christian work for the Lord? All those good works that he's prepared for me to walk in, because who will do them if I don't? Who will do them if I don't? Not if you've been listening faithfully to faithful biblical preaching in this place for decades. And no, the Bible doesn't say God helps those that help themselves. That was one Algernon Sidney in 1698, a politician. Why am I not surprised? 
And as for faith earning me God's appreciation, Ephesians 2.8, for it is by grace, that's God's unmerited favour, that you have been saved through faith. This is a gift from God, not works to boast of. But yes, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And yes, God has prepared them in advance for us to do. So Christians strive to do these good works because of our relationship with Jesus, having already been saved by him. Not so that we can earn salvation begrudgingly from him or claim to have accomplished something for God in my own strength. Shades of Ozymandias, a poem by Shelley. It says, Ozymandias, king of kings, look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. But all that's left is a shattered statue in a featureless desert. Ozymandias, have a read, brilliant. As with any work that I might tempt, that might tempt me to say, see God, look what I've done. Isaiah 26, 12. If you're not writing anything else down today, write down Isaiah 26, 12. It was a blinding revelation when I read it. It says, Lord, you established peace for us. All that we have accomplished, you have done for us. All that we have accomplished, you have done for us. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. God shepherds his sheep in everything. And here's a nice list of adverbs for you. Constantly, faithfully, consistently, continually, caringly, unendingly. Not just in our troubles and weaknesses, but in all circumstances, including times of prosperity, including times when we exercise our strengths, even for the Lord. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's wrong to exercise our strengths and use the gifts that God has given us. That's not what I'm saying. But we need to keep them in the hands of the Lord while we're doing it. He rejoices when one sheep is found, one lost sheep is found, as in the reading from Matthew 18, and delights when we serve others using our gifts as he designed them. Now, lots of psalms exhort us to take refuge in our God. Psalm 27, 14. We're told to wait for the Lord. Be strong, yes. Take heart, yes. But do it waiting for the Lord. We're not asked nor expected to do our own fighting. Paul's armour of God is almost exclusively defensive. And the offensive weapons are actually wielded by God anyway. Because God has done it for us. It's by his strength and in his strength that we stand. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing now and forever. I have learned the secret of what it means to be content. Even though peace isn't escape. Contentment isn't complacency. Rather, the Christian recognises, trusts and delights in God's eternal character as shepherd to those who want that relationship with him. 
and it's made possible by Jesus Christ and Easter. We're to trust him. Even when we can't see the answer, the rhyme or the reason along the right path. We know this is true. But Christian humanity still finds it hard because we are simultaneously saint and sinner, strong in the Lord and weak in ourselves, this side of heaven. But for natural humanity, unredeemed, unsaved, self-centred humanity, it's impossible. They can't see, they can't see God, they can only see themselves. You see, the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 demonstrates this. They said to each other, come let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to heaven so that, listening, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Let's make a name for ourselves, the cry of humanity that doesn't want a relationship with the one who actually says in 2 Samuel 7, I will make your name great. I will make your name great. Now, yes, God meant David as king and shepherd of Israel. And he meant Jesus as king and shepherd and saviour of the world. But he also means you and me, for whom he, our shepherd, makes a name. And the name is Christian. Christian. A name founded on the death and resurrection of Jesus and claimed through faith, not effort. God said, I will make a name for you. Not you will make a name for yourself. And certainly not, I will help you make a name for me, God. No, Isaiah 26, 12. The Lord... Lord, you established peace for us. All that we have accomplished, all that I have accomplished, you have done for me. But still some might misunderstand the extent of God's shepherding. Now these misunderstandings may well be well-meaning, even true as far as they go. But they fall short of God's all-encompassing shepherding. Some Some pick up on the only verse in scripture that I could find where God speaks of himself acting like a mother. Isaiah 66, 13. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you, says God. But Psalm 23 acknowledges that comfort is one aspect of God's shepherding. Come back in two weeks. But it's a parent's intention that a child grows up and becomes independent and takes responsibility for itself. It's never God's intention that his children ever become independent of him. Nor, for that matter, responsible for themselves. So as an image, mothering is beautiful. But it falls short of the totality of God's shepherding. God might meet any and every situation. Terrific. But isn't a tap that we can turn on and off. Mark 6 has a story that starts with totally inadequate human resources. Five loaves and two fish. But it ends with 5,000 men, not counting women and children, 5,000 men being well fed. But only because these meagre resources 
were given to the Lord to use as he saw fit. Similarly, the Lord's Prayer exhorts us to call on God for the provision of our daily bread. It means each day. But he also refused to turn stones into bread in Luke 4. Which in my mind means he was, he was also not going to woo people with a supernatural meal ticket. We're to be content with the Lord's provision but not complacent about it. Three. three. Three is different because God's abundance is actually so rich that even an apparently total outsider, for example, Mark 7, a Gentile woman, a total outsider who begged Jesus to drive a demon out of her daughter, she shared in God's abundance but on God's terms faith in Jesus well Mark 10 shows us a man who by human standards is so far in that Jesus disciples were amazed to think that one who probably never physically lacked anything could possibly miss out on the ultimate blessing. How could a rich, young ruler possibly have need of a shepherd? Actually, he had great need, a great unseen need for a shepherd. God's shepherding could be more important in our good times than in our bad times. Because in good times, we're apt to think that we can make a name for ourselves. It's okay, God. Thanks. I've got this covered. But I'll call on you if I need you. Maybe we can make a deal. That's not personal lowliness. That's not personal humility. That's not joyfully accepting God's shepherding because of a continuous daily relationship built up over time and through experience. Prayer, strengthening relationship, leading to deeper prayer, leading to, you get the idea. But how might we approach the apparent paradoxes in God's shepherding of us? that we recognise from our own lives. Now, mostly I've been content with Deuteronomy 29, 29. Deuteronomy 29, 29. It says, The secret things belong to God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. The secret things belong to God. But the things revealed belong to us and our children forever. And that's not a cop-out. It's not a cop-out. It's a humble statement of unshakable trust in our shepherd. Even if he keeps some things secret. That's perfectly understandable to trust God at our weak points when we have no other option. But then why are we testing our options before turning to God? You see, we just get it so muddled up, so easily. We need to learn to walk unswervingly with God as he walks consistently with us. We should depend on God by faith in our troubles and sorrows, of course. We should also depend on him when things are neutral. And especially when things are good. Or when our strengths are on show to the praise of God. In faith, Hebrews 11. Faith, confidence about what we don't see. 
because Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. It is impossible to please God without faith. Christians hold fast to Christ through thick and thin because the Lord is our shepherd. It's his doing. Romans 4.14. They will stand for the Lord is able to make them stand. Lord, you established peace for us. All that we have accomplished, you have done for us. So if the Lord is our shepherd, just give me down tools, let go and let God, no. 1 Corinthians 3, one plants, another waters, but God has been making it grow. So we still must walk in God's right paths. But we need to distrust natural strength even as we struggle towards and with God's will in our lives. So have you learned the secret of what it means to be content? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. Brothers and sisters, from that truth, all else follows. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, knowing that the Lord is our shepherd. Knowing it with humility and contentment in green pastures and dark valleys. Like Paul, know that what we do, we do through him who gives us strength. Through him who shepherds us totally, consistently and unfailingly. You see, both before and after his resurrection, Jesus said that he would go ahead of his disciples into Galilee. They were to have faith and follow. They were to have faith and follow. John 14, 3, Jesus says, If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. Because he also said, I am with you always to the very end of the age. He will never leave nor forsake one whose name is Christian. So with humility and contentment in all circumstances, I pray for each one of you and I. Surely, I am sure Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. So be it.